this in this like, here, we think you might enjoy reading about this nutcase. <laughs> well, yeah. I, yeah, I'm sure there's some professional reasons, but uh, I don't know. I mean, it was uh, just something tacky. Yeah. Um, okay, let's look at your homework since it seems to be really troubling people a lot. So let's just go to the homework and see if we can understand what's going on. Okay. Hmm. I think there's a couple little things I didn't do in notes 11 still, uh, but I want to move on. Um, this conditional theorem A, the mean of the conditional mean is really bothering people uh, a lot. Uh, but I think the best way to understand it is simply a statement about how to do a double integral. Okay, conditioning is has to do with writing down uh, the double integral in a certain way. Okay, so let's look to another problem. Well, maybe we can do problem 71. Maybe this will be easier to do. I don't know. Let's have a look at number 71. Let x be a binomial random variable represent the number of successes in any dependent renewal triumphs. And maybe I should actually make it explicit. Instead of using all the n's and p's, let's just go ahead and make it, uh, let's take 10 trials. Let x be binomial and make it a little bit more concrete. Size 10 in parameter p. Okay? And let y um, so so um, x equals summation x i i goes from 1 to 10 to, um, where xi are independent Bernoulli p. Okay, so the xi's are ones and zeros. Right? Each xi, xi equals one or zero with probability p or 1 minus p. Okay, that's what a Bernoulli random variable is. So x is a binomial random variable, the number of successes in 10 independent Bernoulli trials can be thought of as the sum of, you know, the total baseball score, so to speak, in 10 innings. Okay? Where in each inning you either get zero runs or one run. Does everybody understand the baseball analogy? I don't know if you've ever seen the scoreboards or whatever. Maybe the one at Rigby Field is the most famous because it's, it's manual. And they just put up the score for each inning manually. You've probably never been at Rigby Field. Okay. <laughs> you had to be at Rigby Field to enjoy that example. But uh, so, so you're getting, on the first trial, you're getting, you know, a, a score, 0 or 1. On the second trial, you're getting a score, 0 or 1. On the third trial, you're getting a score, 0 or 1. On the fourth trial, you're getting a score, 0 or 1. So everybody understand? And so then you add them up and that's the score. This, this either you got tails or heads on the first inning. Okay? Tails or heads on the second trial. Tails or heads on the third trial, and so on then. Okay. Anyway, the scoreboard looks like that. They just show you what happened in every inning. There's a record of what happened in every inning. Okay. So then we add them up. That's the binomial random variable. Okay. What is y? y in this, let y equal the sum, the same random variables, xi, xi, i goes from 1 to 5. 
So I'm going to look at the number of successes in the first five trials. Okay, that's what this problem is stating. Let's rewrite, read it again on page 173. It says, let x be a binomial random variable representing the number of successes in n independent Bernoulli trials. I'm taking n equals to 10. Let y be the number of successes in the first five trials. Let's say, we're taking n equal to 5 in this problem. The number of trials for y. Find the conditional frequency function of y given x equals x and the conditional mean. So what's the conditional frequency function? The conditional frequency function is the probability that y is equal to y given x is equal to x. What's the probability that y is equal to y given x is equal to x? is the total number of runs, so to speak, that were obtained, all 10 in each, okay? And I want the probability for the number of runs that might have occurred in the first five innings, okay? So how would you do that? Okay. So why over So this would be, um, I guess I'll just take it by definition, which is the probability that capital Y equals little y and capital X equals little x, divided by the probability that capital X equals little x. So I'm going to find the conditional frequency function. How would I do that? This means that I got Y runs in the first five innings, and then I got X runs total. So that means I got Y runs in the first five innings, X minus Y runs in the second five innings. total of x runs all together, and we have formulas for all of this, right? This is the probability, I'm going to use independence, the probability that that summation xi, i goes from 1 to 5, is equal to y. This is the, that summation i goes from 6 to 10, xi, is equal to x minus y, divided by the probability that capital X equals to little x. Taking the last five innings. This is the this is the total number of runs, so to speak. All right, the number of successes in ten trials. Okay, let's go back to successes and failure. You don't like the runs analogy. Okay, this is the total number of successes in ten trials. This is the total number of successes in the first five trials. <laughs> So it had better be that x is bigger than y, otherwise this is the condition of probability is zero. x is greater than or equal to y here. Or y is less than or equal to x is the condition. Alright? <coughs> I can't get more successes in the first five trials than I have gotten in all ten trials. So this is the problem, this the, by definition of initial probability, this is the joint event divided by the given probability of the given event. So I look at the number of successes in the first five trials equal to y, and the number of successes in the last five trials equal to x minus y. Okay. Because that's what it has to be in order for that event to hold. It's exactly, this is exactly it. Now I have independence because these sums are over disjoint sets of the xi's. Sets of indices. I goes from 1 to 5, I goes from 6 to 10. So these two random variables are independent. Moreover, this is a binomial random variable. This is a binomial random variable. Right? It's a number, it's a total, it's a sum of independent probability, so it's a binomial. So I know how to calculate all of this. This is, um, I can only get, and y also has to be um, less than or equal to 5. Right? So it's less than or equal to x and it's less than or equal to 5. The minimum minimum of x and 5. Okay? So what's the bit of a problem here? Y is less than with x and it's also less than with 5. I'll just put comma here. Alright? But, okay, so 
go through the minimum of those. Okay? If x is 8, I can I can get uh, I can only go y goes from 0 to 5 still. Mm -hmm. But when x is 4, I get y goes from 0 to 4. So the range of the condition, the range of y values that are possible depends on x. Okay? But it just doesn't go up to x, it goes up to the minimum of x and 5. Alright? So y equals 0, 1, 2, up to the minimum of x and 5. Okay? Some function of x. That's where it is. So here we have it. So I'm going to have. Um, I have 5 choose y, okay, uh, p to the y, 1 minus p to the 5 minus y, and the first 5 trials times. Uh, again, it's just, it's, there's, it's a binomial of size 5, parameter p. 5 choose x minus y, p to the x minus y, 1 minus p to the 5 minus x minus y. This is binomial. Five. And this is binomial. Five and eight. Okay? I don't know if this is the best problem to understand this stuff or not. But anyway, here's how you find a conditional. This is a not truly conditional mass function. And this was 10 choose x. P to the x, 1 minus p. Now I can cancel a bunch of junk. Notice what happens. Uh, 1 minus p to the 10, and then all of, all of 1 minus p to the p's cancel. There's p to the x minus y, p to the y, that cancel with p to the x. Okay. 1 minus p to the 5 minus y, and 1 minus p to the 5 minus x minus y comes out to be 1 minus p to the 10 minus x. Okay? All this cancels. And so I simply get 5 choose y, 5 choose x minus y over 10 choose x. This is a hypergeometric distribution, actually. That comes out to be that. Y goes from uh, 0 up to the minimum of x and y. Okay. You'll see this um, if the Somewhere back in chapter two, one of the sections we didn't cover is actually this discrete um, probability mass function is shown. I believe. I hope it's okay. I believe it's shown. Let's see. It would have been a discrete case. Chapter two. Let's see. There it is. It's uh, the hypergeometric distribution, page forty-two. But they didn't tell you the range of k there. <laughs> um, so that's a little tricky. Here, here you understand that, that, that k does have a range that depends on the parameters, actually. Okay? So, let's see. This means what you have is that you've got an urn with five white balls and five black balls. Okay? And um, this is the probability, well, so that I'm getting, well, let's say, uh, that, um, that I get, um, y black balls and x minus y white balls. balls from that urn. Pick x balls from that urn. And I get y black balls and x minus y black balls. Okay. That's the probability. So that's kind of intuitively makes sense. There are there are uh, the first five units correspond to the black balls, the last five units correspond to the white balls. Okay. Let's just say I'm going to get 
x ones, right? How many of you have the innings? Okay? <laughs> Those are trials, how many zeros and ones? Okay. So I'm just going to pick x balls out of the so that's the hypergeometric output. What's the conditional beam alpha? Okay, that looks bad, right? So I have to find the mean of this. I have to some y goes to <laughs> some y. So how would I get that? What's the conditional mean? That's the expected value of y given x equals x. I think the best way to do it is to re realize that it is the uh, mean of a hypergeometric distribution. What would be the expected number of black balls then? If I pick X balls. What's the probability of getting a black ball the first pick? If I pick X balls, so this would be the expected number. So, you know, crucially you'll have to multiply this by Y in sum, right? So this is a very difficult problem if you don't realize this hypergeometric like context. So this would be the summation y times 5 choose y, 5 choose x minus y, over 10 choose x. y goes from 0 to the minimum of x and 5. Okay. That looks like a nasty thing to compute, right? Maybe I'll tabulate it with a computer or something, okay? <laughs> and then we'll just, um, well, I mean, it is just, could do it because the numbers are explicit here, 5 and 10, right? 5, 5 and 10. So, um, how could we do it, given that this hypergeometric distribution? Uh, if I really did have 5 black balls, okay, and 5 white balls, okay, in a urn that contains 10 balls, and I pick X balls, Less than equal to 10, okay? Balls from an urn containing um, five black and five white balls. And then this expectation is the expected number of black balls. is actually the number of balls that I picked out, okay, in this context then. So of course this is going to depend on x. What should it just be? Should x be just be, should just linearly relate to x, shouldn't it? Like x over 2 or something? Yeah. Probability of one half of getting a black ball on each, on each triangle. Probability that the first ball is black is one half, 5 out of 10. What's the probability the second ball is black? Do you remember that from your elementary, from your first probability course? It's the same. Okay, probably the second ball is black because the second is the problem where the first ball is black. Because we, the way we taught that was if you have a, if you have a deck of cards, okay, well, the problem is the first card is the queen of hearts. One over 52. One over 52. What's probably the second card is the queen of hearts? Zero. No. That's, that's the conditional probability given the first card is the queen of hearts. Oh. Okay. What's probably the second card is the queen of hearts? What? By replacing. Period. Unconditional probability. Oh, un unconditional probability. No, uh, See, that's the thing. Listen to me. Because okay. you already had. No, I didn't do anything. You're just dealing with face down. Okay, what's the probability of the last card is your queen of hearts? The bottom of the deck. Well, they just deal off the bottom of the deck and put it on the top of the deck, like some magician friend or something. Okay? Okay? <laughs> this is the same probability. 1 over 52. Well, if you draw the first one out, there's only four. No, I'm not drawing the first one out. You're just dealing with them. I'm oh, just okay. dealing the second one dealing. is the first okay. card. Okay, I'm dealing the second card is the first card. One out of 52. So the probability that each one of the balls that I pick out in sequence is black is the same. It's one half every time. Okay. So I'm going to draw X balls. So I get, uh, so in other words, I can write this, this, this thing, this number. This number of black balls, 
I can write as a sum of indicators equals a sum of indicators. I sub i, i goes from 1 to x, okay, where i is 1 or 0 again. All right? They're not independent now, so, like the x's were. X's were 1 or 0 with probability theta. The i's are 1 or 0 with probability 1 half, and they're not independent. Because the event that the first ball is black and the second ball is black, those are not one half times one. That the event doesn't have probability one half times one half, as you know. Okay? The probability of the first and second card of the Queen of Hearts is zero. Okay. So the events of the first card is the Queen of Hearts and the event of the second card of the Queen of Hearts are not independent. Alright? They are correlated. So these are correlated random variables. Okay, but these have expectation one half of probability associated to the indication, indicator, <laughs> 1 or 0, 1 or 0, all right, with probability 1 half each, not independent. But the mean can be calculated as the mean of the sum of the means. So the mean of each one of them is 1 half. So therefore, the expected number equals um, summation i goes from 1 to x, x is fixed here, uh, expected value of pi, which is summation i goes from 1 to x, 1 half equals x over 2. So that's the conditional mean. Um, and that's not a problem, is it? If x was 5, then you get 5 halves if x was 7, um, you still get what do you think is 7 halves? If x is what? 10, you get 5, the expected number. Why do we think half? Because there's only black and white. Or yeah, the 1 half came from the 5. So this would have been m over n in the general problem. 1 half. m over n. So we get x times m over n. The answer should be x times m over n for the answer to problem number 71. Independent of p. Independent of p. Let's see if that's right. <laughs> they better have it right in here. That was a lot of work. Yeah, okay. Wow. Okay, so it took us far afield, but it didn't teach us theorem A, unfortunately. <laughs> okay. Let's see, was there a way to do it with their main note? Because we just wanted to calculate the conditional expectation. Now, at least it is consistent with their main note. Because what is the expected value of y? At least we could show the consistency with their main. What's the expected value of, of y? The expected value of y is obviously just um, 5p, right? Or mp. What's the expected value of x? The expected value of x is np. Okay. So if I replace x by np, I get mp. Right? Np here, and we'll cancel get mp. So at least it's consistent. It's the simplest answer consistent with their a. <coughs> so you might have guessed the answer. Right? If you thought, oh, why? The conditional expectation is just so, so long. Linear function of x. E of y is mp, or 5p in this case. I've got E of x is 10p. And if, and if I guess that EY given x is equal to ax, okay, then the only way to have this consistent is if to have a is 5 tenths. Okay? Because I must have that the expectation of the conditional expectation is equal to the expectation of y. Okay, so I have to have the expectation of ax. Expectation. So this comes out to be a function of x, the conditional expectation of y. Right? It comes out in terms of x. If I do the summation over here of 
why, even though there's a nasty looking thing. If I sum on y, this is something that depends on x alone, then, right? Even though it looks very nasty and ugly and so on. Okay? And all these, you know, maybe just try it for x equals 7 and, and okay, or x equals 4. Try it for x equals 4. What does it look like? Let's just check it for x equals 4. What does this look like? For x equals to 4. Make it as small as this. Make it x equals to 3. Okay? <laughs> Make it easier. Okay, what does the sum look like? Okay? The sum looks like summation y goes from 0 to 3. 5 choose y. 5 choose uh, 3 minus y. See how I had to have y less than 3? Because I have a 3 minus y here. Divided by 10 choose 3. What is 10 choose 3? It's 10 times 9 times 8 over 6. Okay. Equals. Uh, So I have, let's see, so then the, if I have to multiply this by y, okay, to get the conditional mean. So I put the probability and then multiply by y. So let's just check this thing. This is 5, then, this is 0 times 5 choose 0, 5 choose 3 over 120, plus 1 times 5 choose 1, 5 choose 2 over 120 plus 2 times 5 choose 2, 5 choose 1, over 120, plus 3 times 5 choose 3, 5 choose 0, over 120. If you look at it like this, you say, I'll never figure out what that formula is in terms of x. Okay? <laughs> but it works out to be 5 choose 3 is the same as 5 choose 2, which is 10, right? That's the score for 2. 5 choose 1 is 5. So this is, uh, that's 0 plus 5 times 10 is 50 over 120, plus 2 times 5 times 10, which is 100 over 120, plus 3 times 10, 30 over 120. 180 over 120, which is 3 halves. You can take the way 1, 1 half x. So it does work out in here. And so, what I'm saying is that this comes out as a, that must, this is a function of x. Okay, when I sum up the y. All right? And so we're calling that, and we're guessing that that was a times x over here if we tried to go with the shorthand solution. Okay? And if I guess that, then, then it must be that e times a times x is equal to e y. Okay? Well, but I know what the expectation of x is. I know how to deal with the expectation of a times x. You just pull the a out. So it tells you what a has to be. Right? I know that. I know the expectation of x. So that gives me an equation for a. It was an more random in general. Yes. <laughs> so the, P, the, the answer was independent of p. That was the point. That's the problem. So, so this is the theorem A, that I, um, which I didn't really, wasn't able to illustrate that well. Um, well, I guess I could try. See, let's see, if I wanted to get EY out of this mess, how would I do that? I'd have to work backwards, right? I'd have to, uh, if, I took, if I tried to apply theorem A to this equation and make sure I get EY back again, make sure everything is okay, how could I unravel this? How would I say, is this, um, is EY equal to the expectation of the conditional expectation? Okay. From this nasty formula, how would I go back to why? Okay. Well, I have to multiply this by, how do I calculate the expectation of the conditional expectation like this? This is some function of x, right? We said it was one half x, but pretend we don't know what it is again. Okay? 
then from this formula, I just run this thing back with the forces I put on the face, okay? The only hard part was actually calculate the mean of hypergeometry so far, really, which is a separate issue, all right? Okay. It's pretty much a separate issue, though it does begin with the beginning of chapter four. Okay. This is, if I wanted to calculate this, this would be a summation. I'd have to multiply by the dent, by the probability mass function of x, right? P sub x of x. And then I would put whatever this nasty thing is, and I'll just put in this whole expression, depending on x. y goes from 0 to the minimum of 5 x. y, and I have 5 choose y, 5 choose x minus y. Sometimes you have to burn a little bit of ink, or 10 choose x, okay? And then I have x goes from 0 to 10, right? Because that's what it does. How could I, does this double sum equal the expected value of y, which is a very simple thing, right? How do you get that? Well, let's put in the probability mass function for x. Probability mass function for x was something I erased in here. It was the 10 choose x, right? I'm just going to skip a line now. Hopefully you bear with me. 10 choose x, p to the x, 1 minus p to the 10 minus x. Okay? So that will kill the 10 choose x, right? Okay. Then what do I have to do to make this look something good? This looks bad, doesn't it? Um, that looks really bad. <laughs> I have to change the order of summation. Okay? But that's essentially what you do. You change the order of integration to, to get this thing. Change the order of summation. Is I'm going to get, in general, when x is bigger than 5, right, y goes from 0 to 5. So I do get y equal to 5 in this double sum, lots of times. So what I do basically is I say y goes from 0 to 5. I have to take the maximum range for y. Okay? That's the maximum range for y. Okay? And then how do I put the sum in? x, I'll teach you some more mathematics if you want to know, probably. x goes. From what? X is always bigger than Y, so X goes from Y to 10, okay? And then I just have all this junk in here. I'll, I'll put the Y outside here now, okay? So then I have, what else do I want to put outside? I want to put the 5 choose Y outside, right? That's good out there. Then I have, um, then I'm going to want to split this P X and 1 minus P to 10 minus X up and all that good stuff, right? So that comes out to be uh, 5 choose x minus y. Let's see. What do we have to worry about? 5 choose x minus y. That could, could that be uh, x minus y could be 0 up to x equals 10. This looks bad, actually. Uh, there's another condition that I have to put on here. Um, X goes from Y to 10, but if uh, Y had to stop at 5, let's see. How you actually try to verify this in a particular case is nasty, but if you actually use the general formulas, it's quite simple. Okay, so let's unravel this thing and then we'll know this theorem. Okay. <sighs> 5 choose x minus y. What could happen if x, let's see, we had x equal to 3 right before. That was a problem, right? x equals to 3. And so y can't, x can't start, so a, x equals to 3 and y. Um, had to only go up to x. 
Okay, so y goes to 5, though. Okay. Um, so x, if, if y was 5, all right, if y was 5, then x must have been greater than 5. Okay. Yeah, y is 5, then x must be greater than 5. So this is okay. But when y is 3, so x is 10, then x getting all the way up to 10 is a problem, right? So I have to stop this thing. Um, x can only go up to um, y, plus y plus 5. Yeah. <laughs> no, why not 10? No, it can't go all the way up to 10. It goes up to 10 when it gets up to 10. When it gets when y is 5, but it can't get up to 10 otherwise. Okay? So then we have this times, I'll put a p to the um, x minus y, and I'll put a p to the y up here. I'll put a 1 minus p to the 10 minus x minus y, and I'll put a 1 minus p to the um, 5 minus y over here. Okay, that fixes it. Okay? And now, if I do this sum, x goes from y to y plus 5, I might as well change variables then. x minus y equals u. Then u goes from 0 to 5. Alright? So this is, the, the inner sum is simply 1. Okay? This is just 1. How do you get 1 out of that? because I pulled all the other stuff out. That's just the, this is summation, u goes from 0 to 5, 5 choose u, p to the u, 1 minus p to the 5 minus u, okay? Yeah. Which is the sum of the binomial density. Oh. Okay? Which is 1. And then what's outside here is, you can hardly read it anymore, okay, is the expectation of a binomial random variable of size 5 in parameter p. That's 5p. Okay. Yeah, so it's a little cavalier here. So this double sum is nasty. Okay? So what's the proof using general notation where you don't have to worry about the limits of integration because it's always just whatever the limits are that work out to you. You don't even put the limits of integration down. Okay? So you don't have to worry about what actually you just put minus infinity or infinity in a continuous case. And in the discrete case, you're saying that the, the expected value of y given x is in, in formulas is the summation p y given x y slash x times y. Okay. Y goes whatever y goes from, and this when this becomes zero, it just becomes zero. So this is the sum over all y, right? And then the expected value of the conditional mean is therefore the summation of this value. That's the that's the function of x that you need to put in. So it's y p y given x, y such as x. It's actually a function of x. Okay? So it came out to be three halves when x was three. Okay? Take your, and then you sum and then you multiply this times p sub x of x and then sum on x. Okay? Now what you do formally is you multiply these conditional probability mass functions times the marginal probability mass function, you get the joint probability mass function. So you multiply these together, you get p of x, y. The joint probability mass function. Then you have this y, and you have the sum on y, and you have the sum on x. Okay, well I can, that's just the expectation of y. Because remember, I can always write the expectation of y using two variable formula. Why is that? If I reverse the order of summation, which is what I do, summation y, summation x, I pull the y out, you have p, x, y here. What you actually get, though it wasn't obvious from this formula over here, this is the marginal density of y. Because I summed out the x, this is the marginal probability mass function of y. Okay? Which is expectation of y. So I think collaborating through a nasty looking problem maybe is, is worthwhile. Okay? <laughs> because in the specific, it just becomes like a total nightmare how to actually make this operation work. All right. But in terms of the, uh, the theorem, it's, it's really a piece of cake.
Now, let's go back to problem 61. Are there any questions about that? Or let's switch gears a little bit. So this is their pay. Hopefully you get it. <laughs> Do you want to see the solution cast in terms of theorem A? Or, well, for example, okay, for one of the problems, yeah, the one of the problems, yeah, you want to set up theorem A for one of the problems. I think that was the problem with the elevator. Well, I guess when I looked at those two, they seemed to be, I mean, very intuitive um, yeah. to me. And, like I was explaining earlier, I don't know if I was on some line. Yeah, it's totally intuitive. Line, That's <laughs> totally intuitive. For problem 66, it's totally intuitive. Mm -hmm. Okay. But you want to set up like I want to set up. The reason okay. is this, is that it's not right. totally obvious if you start thinking about it a little bit. Okay. So, but then, then you, would, you would come to the formula quite easily. Okay. So in other words, theorem A should, is obvious, right, if you think about problem number 66. What's problem number 66? Problem 66 tells you that the, the uh, average waiting time for the slow elevator is three minutes, and average waiting time for the fast elevator is one minute. I guess to uh, and choose the fast elevator with probably two thirds. Somehow, maybe I don't know why they don't always choose the fast elevator, but there must be some reason. Okay. Yeah, okay. So, so what you have is you have a fast elevator, waiting time, E T one equals three. Actually it's one minute. Okay? Then you have the slow elevator waiting time. Expected value of T2 is equal to 3. So T1 and T2 are random variables. They don't, it doesn't, you don't just have to wait one minute for the fast elevator. You have to wait a half a minute or up to maybe five minutes. I mean, even on a fast elevator, we don't know. I mean, it has some distribution. Okay, it can happen maybe rarely that you have to wait five minutes for the fast elevator. But you chose it, you're going to wait in line there. Okay. <laughs> okay. Maybe it really has a tighter distribution, so we never have to wait three minutes. Okay, but okay, this is the rule. Okay. You once you chose it, you're gonna have to switch. Um, so then, what's the expected value? And then you choose choose t choose fast with probability two thirds. Slow with the complementary probability, obviously, one third. Okay, then what's the expected time you have to wait on average? So, in other words, if you, if you think of it this way, you're going to do, think about it in terms of a sequence of trials, in terms of the, in terms of the relative, or in, some, in terms of averages. In other words, uh, Today you're going to pick an elevator and you're going to wait. And you're going to get a waiting time. So you get a time. Right? Tomorrow you're going to get a time. The next day you're going to get a time. The third day or fourth day you're going to get a time and so on and so forth. And so you're going to average all those times up for many, many days. And that's the answer you want. So, I mean, the times that you're waiting are some weird times, like 35 seconds, 80 seconds, you know, all kinds of weird times, okay? So it just looks like a continuous random variable if you think about it like that, okay? So why should it just be the average of those two, time, two averages? Why should it be a weighted average of those two averages? That's the answer. Well, you can think about it that way. Because actually, you can think of all the times, two thirds of those times you wrote down were from waiting time one, okay? And one third of those times were from waiting time two. If you think of the average of the whole thing, you think of it as uh, a weighted average of those two times, where the weights have to do with how many times you put in time one and how many times you put in time two. 
You put in time one, two thirds of the time. You put in time two, one third of the time. So it's obviously just two thirds et one plus one third et two. Okay, intuitively. But the distribution of, and then you can actually figure out, but the, and the distribution of the actual times that you're waiting is actually a mixture. Okay, it's two thirds. It's two thirds of one density. Okay, f one of t plus one third f two of t. It's actually that is always a density. Okay, it's, a, it's called a mixture. Because if this is a density that integrates to 1, this density that integrates to 1, so obviously that's a non negative quantity that integrates to 1. 2 thirds times 1 plus 1 third times 1 mixture. So you could actually figure out that, uh, that the expected value from this, then, if you integrate t against this, dt, you simply get 2 thirds times dt1 plus 2 thirds, 1 third times dt2. So there's another proof of it in this very simple case. This is theorem A again. Case. But what you're supposed to do is set it up as a random variable x is fast or x is slow. Actually, the, the x would be a non numeric variable, fast or slow, it doesn't matter how you apply this thing. Okay. okay. So, any, any more comments about this one? So that's a relatively easy one, but. you can think of is picking out certain of the, the numbers that you saw, right? Pick out the number. In other words, you've got all these numbers, times, on the waiting times for the various days that went to the elevators. And conditioning means, conditioning on x equals fast means pulling out those numbers on the days you pick the fast elevator and averaging them. Okay? But that's what you're saying, obviously, by the independence of days. So that's intuitive, but anyway, you are using theorem A officially. Okay? 72. I don't think I got right. 72, again, is kind of a very interesting thing. You've got an item that's present in a list, probability P. If it's present, this position in the list is uniformly distributed. So again, you have an indicator variable, roughly speaking. X is 1 if item is present, X is 0 if it's not present. Or it's just two values. You can make a non numeric variable. Okay? Present or not present. Right? Yeah. And one, that's your X. Okay? What's the conditional mean of, of the search time given that you, the item is present? N plus 1 over 2? That is correct. Yeah. And then you okay. multiply the cases of. So what you have is that the conditional mean of y given x equals present equals n plus 1 over 2. What's the conditional mean of y given x is not present? Zero. Um, no. You're going to search through every item. You don't know that it's not present. Why is that? I'm sorry to back up. Why is it n plus 1 over 2, not n over 2? Because uh, it's a discrete uniform, 1, 2, up to n. You did that problem too. Oh, okay, because okay, you're counting on points, all right. Yeah. You did the problem too. You calculated the mean of a discrete uniform, mm -hmm. 1 through n. It was n plus 1 over 2. Everybody got the homework back, and they all got it right. Okay? <laughs> okay, so I don't mind getting that out, okay? And the condition, what's the number of searches that you'll make if uh, the item isn't present? It's sure to be n. So the condition mean, 
is n. So then you have two conditional means, and now average them according to the weights. Do you understand that? The conditional mean of x is not present. So it has to search all of them? And doesn't find it? Is that what right. you're saying? Okay. And it's, oh, it's not here. At the end. The sources of all gift and it says I never found it, and therefore not here. Oh, okay. Some of that. Then you find the average time you're gonna have to search to, to either find it or know that it's not there. Okay. And that's the conditional that's the mean of y. Alright. This is a nice little problem, what do you think? A very nice application of theorem A. It's not too tough, but as we saw in problem 75, then you have the non trivial case where the marginal density of the variable is, even though you're given the, the joint density. One of the marginals is quite difficult to compute. So you really want to use theorem A. But how would you, so you can't find the density in closed form problem 75, the unconditional density of U. 75. Okay. Yeah. 75, you can't find, but how do you, there, therefore, do you, you can find the, the mean, the unconditional mean of U by using theorem A. How would you find the unconditional variance of U, though? If you can't find this density, what else, what theorem are we going to have to use? Variance of u. Yeah. So what you have is that you're given that you're given that e of you're given that. Let's put it this way: you're given that x is exponential lambda. Let's put it back in terms of x y's. Okay. So please don't use this; it's confusing. Okay. Well, from the context of the theorem, and then t, excuse me, y given x is equal to x is uniform on 0 to x. Okay, that's the way we write it. Right? That's the condition. This is, instead of writing down the conditional density, this is the information that's given. So therefore, the conditional mean of y given x, x, that's kind of obvious, is x over 2. All right? So therefore, we write that the e of y slash x with a capital you just substitute the capital in place of the lowercase, and you write x over 2. So that's the, that's the random variable. x over 2? Yeah. How do we get that? You know, oh. previous line, all I do is replace the little x by the capital x. Okay? That's all I'm doing. Okay? So I regard this as a random variable. Okay? So with the capitals in there, it's a random variable. With the little x in there, it's a number. Okay? <laughs> All right, the mean of y given x, just that one height on the on the you know y versus x plot. Remember where I put in the yeah. density and I put I took the and I looked at the average of the dots in the column. Okay, that was a number x over two. Okay, but if we now regard you know uh, I think it's, but I think if all the x values thrown together, then they get a random variable. Okay, you know those probabilities associated with them by looking at the probabilities, by looking at the number of dots in the column, and basically using that as a measure of what the probability of the x is. All right? All right. So that's the notation. All right? Now, so the expected value of y by theorem A is just the expected value of x over 2. So then you can know that by knowing the expected value of an exponential, which you can either get out of the notes or out of the back of the book by playing around. Okay? What is the expected value of an exponential? 1 over lambda. That's correct, 1 over lambda. Yeah. All right. So now how do I get the variance of y? Whoa, whoa, whoa. How about let's get that unconditional me and y first. I did. You did. 1 over 2 lambda. 
this expectation of x over, I just, I have to take the expectation of this. How do you take the expectation of that? x over 2? Yeah. We just said the expected value of x is 1 over lambda. This, yeah. is, a this is a constant times x. Oh. So All right. 1 over lambda over 2. Yeah, expected value of x over 2. Okay. I'll write it down. It's 1 over 2. I'm going over lambda. Okay. What? <laughs> I thought you had an integrate or something. Well, no, because I used the table. All right, I know what they expected to be. This is 1 half times the interval x e to the lambda e to the minus lambda x. Okay, yeah, let's go back to, to, to dx, 0 to infinity. Yeah, so there you usually have an integral. Yeah, mm -hmm. we do have an integral. But I know what this integral is from the table in the back of the book. I know what that integral is already. We did this integral several times already. I'm not going to do it again. Okay. Okay. So yeah, I did the long hand everything on this topic. Yeah, take, take it. Well, that's good practice. At least you've done the interval now. Okay. <laughs> but I don't want it to do it again. Okay. Oh, I didn't even do it this way. I did a. I did it that I just used the basic definition. And then multiply everything out, change to the limits of the integral, oh, and did all that. <laughs> and now I know there's an easier extra way. Extra credit for making it harder. <laughs> okay, there is an easier way. That's the thing that, that, that you can be forever on this. What is the variance of y, though? This is what I want to get to next. I mean, we're almost out of the hour already. How would I get this? And we didn't even cover some of that stuff in problem 61, but I guess we just have to survive. Okay? How would I calculate the variance of y? Well, there's another formula. It's theorem B. There is a theorem B. Okay? <laughs> and that is that the variance, unconditional variance of y, can be written down in terms of the conditioning. Okay? This is equal to, there's a very nice formula. We used to call it, when I took this course a long time ago, 30 years ago? Okay. Um, we call it Steiner's formula. It's just there in B. And this, I don't know where they came from Steiner's formula. I don't even know Steiner was. But anyway, it's a nice name. So, <laughs> so then uh, we call this is the expectation of the conditional variance. You can talk about the conditional variance plus the variance of the conditional expectation. That is a very nice formula. Okay. E var plus variance. Okay. So what is the conditional variance? The conditional variance. If I write h of x equals the conditional mean of y given x equals to x, which is what we've been building, right? Then the conditional variance is a single integral. Integral y minus h of x, the quantity squared. Variance of y given x equals to x. I would center at the conditional mean, not at the overall mean of y. But center at the conditional mean. Because it's going to center at the, at the mean of the of the conditional density, which is written here, dy. Okay, this is y goes from minus one to infinity for the efficient formula. That is the conditional variance. I center at the mean, in other words, y minus mu squared f of y dy. But mu is now mu, so mu, the mu given by this conditional density. Okay, so that's the conditional variance. Now, the conditional variance is quite easy in this problem because we know what the variance of a uniform is. Remember how I did that? The variance of uniform AB, we mentioned this many times as well, is B minus A squared over 12. Okay, I don't know if that's in the back of the book or not, but we've done it in class. Okay? So I'm not going to make you redo that. So actually, I know what the variance of Y given X is. It's X squared over 12. So I know that function. No, I still have, I will have to do an integral now. If I want to find the, the uh, expectation of x squared over 12, I'll have to, to 
because it's in a globe. So this is a hard problem. Then, the variance of EY given X. Except if I know the variance of the exponential, I can get everything out of the bag. All right? The variance, what is the variance of the exponential? 1 over lambda squared. 1 over lambda squared. All right? The variance of the exponential is 1 over lambda squared. So you can actually use that to good effect. Therefore, the expectation of the square, for example, would be, if you work by backwards, expectation of the square of an exponential would be the variance plus the the mu squared, which would be 1 over lambda squared plus 1 over lambda in quantity squared equals 2 over lambda squared. In fact, we already had that result before. In fact, that's how we calculate the variance of exponential. That's the expectation of the square of exponential. It's 2 over lambda squared. You will if you want to take the expectation of x squared over 12 without doing an integral. <laughs> okay. So, so you have this and then this one, what is, we already knew what that is, this is the variance of x over 2, okay, which you can deal with, okay? So you can get the whole thing out without doing any integrals if you know a little bit about the exponential distribution, okay? From the tables, or from what we already did in class. Okay, so there is Steiner's formula. I didn't derive it. It's got a nice derivation, but uh, maybe I'll leave that to you in the notes. Okay. Any other questions about this homework? We have a couple minutes. You might want to clarify something. We have to wait until Tuesday, right? Until Tuesday. It's not due until Tuesday. In problem 61, you're asked to go through all the covariance and correlation calculations. It's very lengthy. And then in parts D and E, they're looking for MSE. Remember, and maybe I should go through old, that formula on page 153 that you're going to probably need to finish that problem. I'll just do that at the end. I didn't derive this last time. I think I mentioned the formula. I scribbled something on the board at the end of the last page, uh, but I didn't actually derive anything. So let's just point that out. That if I have if that uh, the best linear predictor last time we said was y hat equals mu y plus rho sigma y over sigma x x minus mu sub x okay which is it's it's alpha plus beta x where the only important thing that I know here is that where the alpha is a nasty formula but the beta is equal to this rho sigma y over sigma slope of the regression line. Okay? What now if I actually use this y hat? That's not actually what y is. What's the error in predicting y using that? The MSE, the MSE, mean squared error. Mean squared error. So I, what this means is that I square the error and I take the mean. Mean squared error, right? Mean of squared error, okay? <laughs> like that. That is expectation of y minus y hat squared. Now that officially would be a double integral because you have the y and the x, which is expectation of the y minus alpha plus the beta x, like that, squared, which would be a double integral that means that y minus alpha plus beta x. I thought I would mention this down, that if you do have two variables under the expectation like that, it means I have to take the joint density and just take whatever function it is and throw it in there against the joint density. That was one of the early terms on expectation. I just note that. Okay, I'm not going to use that. Because um, how will I do this? 
you just score the inside and do the expectation. How do I take the expectation like that? It shows us on page 153. Now I'm starting to think about this. Okay. Now, not on page 153. It's on Four. page 154. Okay, what you know is that the, the expectation of the MSC like that, this is always equal to the variance of y minus alpha plus beta x. There's one thing he didn't show. Plus the mean of y minus alpha plus beta x, the quantity squared. This is a general formula for mean square error. You can't, it's not, the expectation of the square is not the same as the variance. The expe, it's the variance plus the expectation, the square of the expectation. How do you just add that over here? The variance, expectation of the square is the variance plus the mean squared. That's the general rule. So what is the mean of y minus alpha plus beta x? Well, if you look at this formula, it's quite simple. Because if we take the, the mean of of, of uh, y hat, that's the mean of y minus y hat. The mean of y hat is mu y plus the mean of this. This is just a constant, that's a constant. The mean of x minus mu x is zero. So the mean of y hat is equal to the mean of y. That means y hat is unbiased estimator of y. Okay, so this, this bias is zero. This is zero. So he neglected to write that down in the book of page 154. Okay? This is being used. Now the variance of y minus alpha plus beta x. That's the same as the variance of y minus beta x because the alpha doesn't have to affect the variance. So that comes out to be equal to covariance of y minus beta x. I'll show you how to calculate the variance now. y minus beta x. So now it's just a calculation, and I claim the calculation is straightforward once you know this type of calculation. So the claim is, at this point, I'm almost done. How would you do that? Remember how I said a covariance was like an inner product? You expand it like an inner product. It's the covariance of y with itself minus 2 beta, the covariance of x with y plus beta plus or minus beta squared times the covariance of x with itself. Maybe I should this one. I can put plus two to minus like that, and then plus covariance minus beta x with minus beta x. Does that make you happy? Okay. <laughs> it's, I think of it as y plus or minus beta x. Y plus or minus beta x. Okay, so the way you calculate the covariance of the sum with the same sum is you just you take all the terms: covariance y with y, covariance minus beta x with y, covariance y with minus beta x, and covariance minus beta x with minus beta x. Then you use the properties of the covariance. I can pull out constants from either side of the comma. And so, and also the covariance y with itself is just the variance of y. I get minus two beta then. The covariance between x and y, which he'll call sigma x, y. Remember how we did that once upon a time? The covariance between x and y. Plus beta squared is so a minus beta the quantity squared times the variance of x. Again, instead of writing sigma x, I have two notations for the variance of x. I could write sigma x, x, or sigma x squared. I have two notations. Now, I'm going to put beta is this rho sigma y over sigma x. I'll write sigma x, y as rho sigma y times sigma x. Then I'll put this minus 2 times rho. I'm just going to sub in now for everything. Rho sigma y over sigma x squared and sigma x squared. <clears throat> so I'll get rid of the xy by putting in rho sigma, by putting in the correlation, and you have a sigma y squared. So now I don't have any double indices. Okay, sigma y times sigma and so on. Now what this cancels out to is what they show in the book, sigma y squared times 1 minus rho squared.
So that's the variance. Alright, excuse me, that's the MNC. Okay? So the bigger rho is, the smaller this is, the better the prediction. Okay? So it's not that hard to remember. Rho is near 1 or minus 1, but it has a very small one. So that's the formula. So now you've seen every computation in the book in this chapter practically, except for moment generating functions, which we'll do next week. Okay. Um, so are we going to homework doing Tuesdays now? Yes. Okay. So I guess we're going to have a test, uh, a test someday. I guess two weeks from Tuesday or something. Two weeks? Okay. Two weeks from Tuesday. Well, it would have been two weeks from today. I'm only going to spend one day in chapter five. Oh. <laughs> okay. So that's Very a short quick. chapter? So I guess two weeks from Tuesday would be something like Halloween. Is that going to be what it's going to be? Yeah, it'll be Halloween. Yeah. Do you want to have a test on Halloween? Sure. Oops. Scary. Two weeks. <laughs> okay. From. Oh. All right. All right. Good enough. Oh, I'll have candy. <laughs> I have some notes.